Macaulay. I'm going to pray it off on February 21st in Syracuse, New York. I want to start with one of the gratitude prayers. And as we all know, uh, Jesus loved the Israelites so much that when they were hungry, he gave them manna from heaven. And to this day, do you ever watch those shows on the History Channel? They're always saying, what was manna? Where did it come from? What is it? It's a big mystery, but it fed them. And this prayer, or, or yes, it's a prayer. It's so beautiful. And let me share it with you. My dear, loving, and generous God, I am so grateful for the many forms of manna you shower me with each new day. I wake to the shower of kisses I receive from my lovable, cherished creatures you gifted me with. Your manna flows as I open the refrigerator to see the wonderful food that gives me a choice of what I want to eat. Your abundant manna keeps coming as I open my closet and dresser drawers to choose from the many choices of clothes I have been able to dress from. In the summer to stay cool and in the winter to be warm. I am grateful for your manna and the gift of my small, just right size home. And with the manna you sent the Israelites just enough, not more than they need. Oh dear, what gift of manna as I open my door for the breathtaking beauty of your earth's creation. Spring's gift of new life, summer's gift of glorious rain and warm sunshine, fall's colors and smells and winter's snow, white crystals clinging to the earth and trees. Another overflowing gift of manna is the love of family and friends you have given me. My dear God, I hope your manna shows through me to others by sharing a smile, giving a compliment, a helping hand to pass on to others. Most of all, I am grateful for your greatest gift of manna, your son, and your abundance of unending love, the grateful. Amen. Is that beautiful? Is that beautiful? And now you know why I was so touched when I read these. I just think they're so powerful, and I just think we really are grateful. And those of you who haven't read, uh, written a gratitude prayer, please do. And don't say, oh, mine won't be that good. We're talking about self-love tonight. We're talking about our own self. Jesus created each one of us different, and he loves us, guess what, unconditionally. One time, I ended a toxic friendship, and I said to the person in a very kind way, I didn't say I never want to see you again, I said, I don't feel when I'm with you unconditional love. I feel like I want to give you unconditional love, but I don't feel it from you. She thought I was crazy. What are you talking about? Unconditional love. That's ridiculous. What are you talking about? And I said, well, I've heard some things you've said about me behind my back, and, and people have told me, and it's really hurt me. And if we were that close, you, you wouldn't say those things. She goes, you're just ridiculous. And then she mocked me. Uh, people would run into me and say, hey, I heard you didn't get any unconditional love from this person. Yuck, yuck, yuck. But isn't that what we want? Don't you want to give your children unconditional love? Don't you, do you say to your children, I will love you when you lose 10 pounds? Oh, no. Do you say to your husband, you know, I'll love you when you buy me a dozen roses? No. And Jesus loves us that much. And I want to talk about how unconditional self-love is the key to weight loss. It all comes around, everybody. We think we just sabotage ourselves with unhealthy food. But the reality is that we sabotage ourselves with blatant disregard for what we need most to feel good. Unconditional self-love. When we feel that unconditional self-love, we will want to treat our bodies with respect. We will value the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. When we become so fixated on the goal of losing weight that we forget to consider our own needs, thoughts, feelings, and emotions, how can we expect to see real results? I feel we're on a journey. I never say, oh, you've been in the group three years and you haven't lost any weight, get out. It, it's a journey. It, it's, it's a, it's a faith-filled journey, and losing weight is a bonus. It's a bonus. If we keep trying, if we keep trying, we will achieve our healthy goals. But never do I feel that you should 
have low self-esteem or low self-image. If you came in and you gained 10 pounds in a week, I'd say, whoa, what was going on? What was happening? I wouldn't say, whoa, you're a piece of crap. You must, I, I, I can't stand you. I'm, I'm, I'm not giving you the unconditional love I usually do because you gained 10 pounds. No. We need to treat ourselves like we treat other people. And here's something very interesting. It is highly unlikely that once you lose those 20, 30, 40, however many pounds you want to lose, that suddenly you're going to love everything about yourself. You know, I've lost quite a bit of weight, but my hair is still very thin. I didn't get really thick hair. Uh, things are going to be about yourself. I, I, I still need glasses. My eyes can get better. There are going to be things about yourself that are still quote unquote flaws. But aren't they really what, who you are? Not everyone can have thick, luxurious hair. Not everyone can not wear glasses when they're 64. It is who you are. I say to my kids, I am what I am, just like Popeye. You know, that's what we are. You must choose to feel good. And guess what, everyone? You have the power. We could feel bad 24 hours a week, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, couldn't we? Couldn't we find things to feel bad about? We could just wallow in the mire and the muck, but we have to lift ourselves up by the bootstraps and say, I will find some joy and I will find something good to think about. And I want you to stop right now and start thinking some good things you like about yourself. And when I stopped to think that, one of the things I thought about myself first was how much hope I have. And I'm like, where did that come from? Because usually people say, oh, I like my laugh, or I like, uh, you know, how I'm nice to people. But I thought, I really like that I have so much hope. I have hope for all of you. I have hope for myself. I have hope for America. I, I had hope that my mother would get better. And then someone might say to me, well, what do you do when your hope isn't doesn't come to fruition, like when your sister passes away from debilitating MS. Well, my hope in that case was that she would always know how much she would love, was loved, and how she didn't die alone, that I had one hand, my other sister had her other hand. That was my hope that she would know, because I know she's in heaven. Sometimes you have to readjust your hope, but it's always there. We need to say goodbye to guilt and shame and just trust ourselves. Think positive thoughts, and I love this one, stay off the scale. There are still people who are doing step aerobics every day, on scale, off the scale, on scale, off the scale. It's like, I'm like, why don't you write that down as a half hour step aerobics? You're on that scale so much. It doesn't matter. Do it once a week and pray it off and be surprised. Be surprised. And then people are like, well, it really keeps me on track, and I want to say, no, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. It really doesn't. Weight loss is not about managing food, but managing your thoughts, beliefs, your feelings around food. I've always believed that. It's never been and it never will be about the food. It's about how we feel. And, and our self-esteem and the love of God are directly in, in, uh, connected. What's interesting is I kind of am a rare breed. I always had pretty high self-esteem, but I had a low self-image. Usually, you have a low self-esteem, a low self-image. Very rarely do people have a high self-image and low self-esteem. But I had a high self-esteem. I said, I can work hard. I can do this. I can try. I can do this. Until it came to myself, until it came to weight loss or taking care of myself. The first night I did pray it off, I didn't do my hair. I had no makeup on. I had crappy jeans and this leopard shirt that did me no favors, pray God. <laughs> At 371, I should not have been looking anywhere near leopard. <laughs> I look at that picture and I say, you didn't even put some makeup on, Ellen. And then over the past 11 years, I have said, you can have a high self-image and still have humility and still have um, uh, not be narcissistic. You can care about your appearance. You can care about uh, your weight and your health. 
So often we think to have a high self-image, you're not a Christian. Not true. We will always have deficiencies. None of us are perfect. But God made us for himself, and he loves us infinitely and personally. He doesn't say, I love Ellen, but I wish you were more like Joe, or I wish you was more like Janet, or I wish you was more like Mary Ellen. No, he loves me just the way I am unconditional. And that feels good to think about that kind of love. And what's interesting is we are made for God and we feel incomplete until we are united perfectly with him. And that's that hole. So often we try to fill that hole with food or gamb gambling or other addictions. Why do you think we live in the richest nation in the world and there are so many unhappy people, so many addicted people, so many people who are committing suicide? So many people who are hating themselves and hating their lives, they're trying to fill that void that God, God's up there going, I am here, I am here, I am here, and we're looking for him, we're looking for that hole to be filled in all the wrong places. The modern world tells us, and do you ever notice that? The modern world tells us all the time that we're wonderful. It's like kids would come home from school and they'd have some like crap on a sheet of paper and the mother is like, that's so beautiful. I know you got an F, but you tried so hard. And my kids would be like, they'd come, they'd bring it home. I'm like, you can do better than that. What is that? I, that's not your best work. And they'd get the biggest kick out of it because they'd see their other friends and their mothers and they'd be ooing and aahing. I'm like, no, no, come on, you can buck up. Come on, let's try harder. And then these same kids are in the car with their parents telling them to shut up, swearing at them. And my kids would get these big eyes, like just imagining telling me or Bob to shut up. Can you imagine? And the thing is, I never felt as a parent that you had to tell your kid you're wonderful all the time. No one ever told me I was wonderful all the time. I don't tell you guys you're wonderful all the time. I say, you could maybe try a little harder. How about uh, getting back in the saddle? How about trying this? And you know what you always say to me? I know. <laughs> but you know what you never tell me to do? Shut up. <laughs> Under your breath you might be. You might have to. <laughs> but anyway, the thing is, the world tries to tell everybody they're wonderful, but we're not believing the world because we got that hole. God loves us no matter what. Also, we need to love ourselves for God's sake. And I'm going to stop right there, Bob, and talk about that.